Now I'm going to introduce today's lunch and keynote speak orbital perspectives with astronaut Mark Van de Heij. Mark was selected by NASA in 2009. He earned a Bachelor of Science in Physics from St. John's University and a Master of Science in Applied Physics from Stanford University. He was commissioned in the U.S. Army through their ROTC program and served as combat engineer. In 1999, he became an assistant professor of physics at the United States Military Academy in West Point, and most recently served as flight engineer on the International Space Station for Expeditions 53 and 54. During this expedition, his crew achieved a week of record-setting research, and Mark logged 168 days in space and ventured outside the spacecraft for four spacewalks. Please give a warm welcome to Mark very much. Thanks, Mark. I got to admit, this is a, a big upgrade from the normal crowd I'm talking to in a, in a grade school gymnasium. <laughs> so thanks very much for inviting me here. Anytime I get to leave the heat of a Houston summer and come experience what Mark Twain called one of the uh, coldest winters you've ever experienced was a summer in San Francisco, um, I'm happy to do that. Um, so in the next 25 minutes, I'm going to try to get through as much as possible because I really want to get to your questions. Um, but I'm going to try to share the unique opportunity I had and the perspectives I've gained from that opportunity by getting to, to serve the nation and the, and the world really flying on the International Space Station. And I have to change the slides. That's why it's not moving. So one of the things about the perspective, you've already seen great views. And again, some of you may recognize this place. This is San Francisco at night. And if you look to the screen on your right, I'll point out where we are right now. There's downtown San Francisco, about where we are. You can see Market Street. Here's uh, the Golden Gate Bridge and the San Francisco-Oakland Bridge as well. Um, that's a little bit of a misleading view, though, because to get that view, I had to zoom in a lot on the camera. Uh, this next view is much more typical of, of what the view looks like for a human being in some small little slice, because you can imagine every direction you look is something like this. But that's a little piece of it. And again, this is San Francisco Bay. Oh, let me go back. That's, <laughs> Sam, there's the punchline. Um, San Francisco Bay right here. In a much more typical view of San Francisco from space, because it's under clouds. And you can see way down here in south in the clear sky, Los Angeles is shining brightly down there. I have a confession to make. Um, every time I'm, uh, I hear someone talk about the microgravity environment that's on the space station, I flinch because I taught physics for so long. And I want to tell people, it's the same roughly, there's an insignificant change in the force of gravity in low Earth orbit due to the Earth compared to standing on the Earth. The real story is the change for an astronaut floating in the space station versus standing on the ground is they're not standing on the ground in the space station. So there's not this big stack of material that's resisting our, our fall towards the center of the Earth like we have right now. Everything in the space station is free falling towards the Earth, except we're moving so quickly horizontally that we keep missing the Earth, thankfully. And then the, uh, but that's got to, that makes it an amazing environment because these effects of sedimentation and convection and buoyancy that we have to deal with doing scientific experiments on the ground, we can, eliminate those in space because everything's in a free fall together so stably. And you can make a stack of three astronauts in space a lot better than on the ground. I'm sure you've heard a lot about the benefits of research and development on the space station for humanity. It benefits humanity now. It benefits humanity in the future as it enables us to explore further and further away. And of course, the benefits to humanity from lots of discoveries. Many people in this audience, I guarantee it, can explain to you the benefits far better than I can. So I'm going to very quickly t touch a couple of things that were kind of neat about being in space and then go into what I feel like I'm uniquely qualified to talk about. Uh, Joe Akaba here, one of the things he did was help out with an experiment to, uh, that bonded bone to metal in, in minutes. You can imagine the benefits that could have to human beings now. We've, over the life of the space station program, we've been able to help motivate 
students to study science, technology, engineering, and math um, by interactions with 42 million students and 2.8 million of their teachers. Joe again, this was a uh, Z-Bot experiment. This was trying to better understand how to control the pressure for volatile fluid, fluids, like as you can imagine, rocket fuel, which I hope you can imagine would have great benefits to traveling further and further away. And of course, as we get away from this great logistics train we have in close proximity to the Earth, it's going to become more and more important for us to be able to create things in space. So our demonstration of 3D printing hopefully will result in the ability to recycle things and build tools in space when they're needed. Now, what I'm uniquely able to talk, thank you, able, uniquely able to talk about is my experience as a human being contributing to this. So I, like was mentioned, flew in space for almost six months. And what I'm going to try to do is share roughly what happened in those six months in about 17 minutes. So here we go. Uh, previous slide and start rolling. Thank you. So I launched in September with two of my crewmates, Joe Akaba, another American, and Sasha Mazurkin, a uh, Russian cosmonaut. I'm super happy I got to launch with these folks. They were wonderful people to be in space, space with. We launched out of Kazakhstan. Quite honestly, the uh, most surprising thing for me about this launch is that nothing went wrong. Because we spent so much time in simulators dealing with the worst possible things that could happen. So it was a very smooth flight. Not just because nothing went wrong, but also it's a very smooth ride. I was kind of looking for something that would give me a better story, like, I, like my teeth were chattering the whole way up, but it was a very smooth ride. The only thing that was somewhat shocking was when we changed from one stage of the rocket boosters to, this, to another stage, and uh, that was a, a big change in acceleration, so we could feel that. And then after we finally got to orbit, the sensation when, when we were no longer accelerating, except for the forces of gravity, um, was that I was at the top of a rocket, uh, a roller coaster, and the ride down was really, really long as we continued to fall. It just seemed really strange that it, I had that sensation last so long. So we were in orbit four times around the planet, six hours trying to catch up to the space station, and we eventually docked to the zenith side of the space station, which is the upper side. So that would have been the view had I seen something other than the uh, window to my left shoulder. Of course, we had to use thrusters to adjust the orbit to actually approach the space station. And in the center of this picture, you can see that docking port. In this next, frame, in this next video, you'll see the, the docking probe. That probe actually gets retracted in towards the space station, or the probe retracts to pull us in towards the space station. Once we've got the uh, interfaces connected, we can connect latches to hold us tightly together and then retract the probe, which is very important because that probe is actually on the end of the, it's on the hatch, and we wouldn't possibly be able to open the hatch without retracting that probe. The space, the Soyuz spacecraft is a very small environment. And you can see Randy here, by the way, was meeting us there. Thanks for that warm welcome, Randy. We're also not just happy to see Randy, though. It was this huge volume inside the space station. It was wonderful to go from that con constrained little volume to this like, large six-bedroom house. It was much bigger than anything that the ground simulations had ever helped me to appreciate. Of course, the whole reason we're there is science. Uh, this short video is me trying to carefully not screw it up and follow the procedure correctly to exchange some uh, gas cylinders in a combustion facility. The, one of the results of lack of convection is that this, the flames are spherical, not like the candle shape we're all used to, as you see here now. Other than showing you how cool it is to float in space, this is uh, a little bit from a training video about one of the challenges with the space environment. Because of the lack of buoyant forces, it's hard to get the bubbles out of something like an IV. So you've actually got to kind of make a pressure differential so that the air will go to the center of the circle and the water will go to the outside if you're going to get those bubbles out. Joe Acaba pictured here was uh, our farmer on board. He grew some uh, lettuce for us. It's really valuable science, and it was also the tastiest thing that we did associated with science. I've grown Mizuna in Houston, but it tasted nothing like the Mizuna that we grew in space, and I'm, that's high praise for the Mizuna that we grew in space. It might have been associated with the fact that that was the only fresh salad I had for five and a half months, but it tasted really good. Move back. 
Thank you. The space station crew is very integrated. The Russians worked on the US segment. We worked on the uh, uh, Russian segment as well. Our favorite exper experiments were the ones that we got to actually see the results of or see how effective they were being. So you can imagine anything with large objects inside the space station was nice for me. It's simple. Um, if you let go of a spoon in the space station, it's an orbit. So you can do some good tests of algorithms to run satellites by letting go of a satellite inside the space station, neglecting the, the effects of airflow, which are fairly minimal. These guys just got a good hero shot here. Um, I had the opportunity to assist with the deployment of some satellites from the space station using this unique capability in the Japanese module. There is a equipment airlock and a slide table that allows us to take things from inside the space station, put it on the side table, deploy it outside. It takes much more time than was just depicted in that video. Afterwards, the ground control team will grab it and deploy it to the right place in the right orientation so we can launch satellites. At this point, my only job was to make sure the camera was pointing in the right direction. So I had to adjust it. <laughs> the European module of the space station is a place where we do lots of life sciences. And because those things are perishable, we have some really good freezers on the space station in the US lab, as well as a J Japanese module where we can preserve those for return to Earth. I keep wanting to run into the darkness. <laughs> After almost th about three and a half months of time in space for me, it was time for Randy and his Soyuz crew to return to Earth. So this is a change of command. I think this is kind of neat because it's very symbolic of the international cooperation as you take a, U a former US Marine fighter pilot turning over command of the space station to a former Russian fighter pilot. Wonderful, wonderful group of people to get to go camping with. Only three days later, we had their replacements come up, bringing our crew complement back to a crew of six, as we had uh, American Scott Tingle, Russian Anton Shkoplerov, and Japanese astronaut Norishige Kanai. It was very apparent to me as soon as I got to the space station that the space station is kind of like a space port. SpaceX's Dragon, which you're seeing launching here, was already docked to the space station when I arrived, and we had lots of work to do to unload it. All of the, both Northrop Grumman's Cygnus vehicle and the Dragon that you see there, uh, get in close proximity to the space station, close enough for, us to, for astronauts to reach out with the robotic arm and capture that vehicle. Afterwards, the ground control team takes over and maneuvers the vehicle to the right place so that they can get it berthed to the correct spot on the space station. Northrop Grumman's Cygnus vehicle does the same thing. Unlike Dragon, as I'm sure you've heard over and over again, Dragon returns th things to the uh, Earth, but we have just as valuable capability in being able to incinerate trash on the Cygnus spacecraft. Both deliver invaluable cargo. Here we're unloading uh, Dragon, uh, obviously time-lapse photography. And you, can, you might notice it's kind of a fun fact as we're using those handrails that you see Sasha's right hand on right now. As you get better and better in the space station, you start using those as tow, tow rails. Transferring cargo in the space station is not hard, it's, but you got to be careful. The more massive objects, if you get them moving too fast, it can be hard to slow them down. Otherwise, it's very easy. And here's the inside of uh, unloaded, largely, Cygnus spacecraft. The Russians also have a Progress spacecraft. We had those visit us as well. Progress is very similar to Soyuz, except it doesn't have the life support, and therefore you get more room to transfer cargo. Of course, leaving the people out gives you more room for cargo as well. And you can see, if you can read Cyrillic, there's a Soyuz and a Progress both in that same view. The X Mission 53 and X Mission 54 crews had five spacewalks take place during that time period. Every single one of those was an entire crew effort. Everybody was participating in some way. I'll never forget when Randy opened the uh, hatch for the first time and I got that sunlight shining into the hatch from outside, it definitely felt like we were getting, going someplace different. Hope you can appreciate the scale of the space station as you see these little people moving around outside of it.
a big focus of the work that our spacewalks had was working on the latching end effector. We had to replace um, those, lube them up, which is a great view in the background. If you're ever having to work on your car and lube it up, you don't get that view. Um, that involved re having to move cameras around and even put high definition cameras on the external television camera group here. Here, I'm riding the arm while Paolo Naspoli was operating it. And that photo credit to uh, Randy again there. And this will be time-lapse photography as well, showing how that arm moves around, gets us to the right place. And again, hopefully helps you appreciate how massive this engineering marvel is compared to a small person. That's only a small part of the space station there. I earned some big points with my wife. Again, I, you know, I gotta give, I, hope not, I, I probably shouldn't advertise this, but uh, Randy did this, so I had to do it too where I put uh, I love you Jules on my wife. He didn't write I love you Jules, he wrote I love you Rebecca. <laughs> Between five and a half hours and seven and a half hours, that was about the rough length of our spacewalks. Um, I was always very happy to have done it, but I was also very happy to have safely completed it. If you spend almost six months in space, you're definitely gonna have to spend some time on mundane activities like personal hygiene, house cleaning, even haircuts. Saturday mornings were cleaning days and very informal days. You can see my uh, tire was shorts and uh, bare feet. Most of the visiting vehicles brought some type of treat, typically something edible for us to try out. Uh, this is, we got the makings for pizza. Paolo Naspoli, our Italian astronaut, wasn't too impressed with our American meat lovers version. <laughs> he and I were the only ones that ate the anchovies. Honestly, it's a very, again, it's a very integrated crew, and on Christmas Day, which is a work day for the American crew members, the Russians went out of their way to make a very meaningful, nice Christmas dinner for us. Every astronaut you ever hear talk, I'm sure, has and will talk about the view, because it is, it is absolutely incredible. The watercolors in the Caribbean are, are just, fantastic, as are the very different colors that you get in the deserts of North Africa. Had a lot of people ask me if the moon looks different. It looks very similar, or just easier to see because there's less atmosphere in the way. We go in and out of the Earth's shadow about every 45 minutes. And because we get to go into the Earth's shadow, that helps the, the city lights really pop out and you can find human civilization very, very easily. Again, this is time-lapse photography, so you'll see very quick flashes of lightning. My favorite time to take pictures was at night when there was a full moon, like you see here, because it, it showed off the water or it would show uh, different colors in the desert, so it highlighted not just the city lights, but also the natural features. This is us traveling over the densely populated area of Europe with the northern lights in the background. Looking out the window on the space station never, ever gets old. Every day, we had about two and a half hours scheduled for exercise. That included the time to get cleaned up afterwards, change your clothes, and uh, tear up, uh, t set up and tear down as well. Joe is working out on the resistive exercise device. When you, uh, if you talked about lifting weights in space, it doesn't really make much sense. So we use a vacuum cylinder to provide the resistive force. Very effective. And every time Joe's doing a sit up, he's seeing the earth through that cupola. The uh, treadmill is also a really good way to help keep us fit. Of course, if you didn't have the bungee cord and the harness, every time you stepped on it, you'd send yourself flying away. Actually, the, I, it struck me when I typed on a keyboard, if I didn't have my feet hooked underneath something, I would push myself up to the top of the station. Bicycle on the space station is there as well, except in space you don't need a seat for the bicycle, which is kind of fun. So after our 168 days in space, it was time for us to turn to finish Expedition 54 and start Expedition 55 with our departure. So Sasha is turning over the command of the space station to Anton. And this process has been continu continuing for a long time with our continuous presence in space, human presence in space.
So you can see we're tightly packed in the, inside the descent module of the spacecraft, getting ready to go home. That descent module is the center part right here. The whole spacecraft departs the space station at that moment. All they do is open up the latches and there's some spring pushers between the space station and the Soyuz that just very gracefully make you go away. And then once you get far enough and it's safe to start firing thrusters, we do that. And later on in that same orbit, when uh, we get to exactly the right point, we fire the main engine thruster to slow ourselves down enough so eventually we'll interact with the atmosphere and the atmosphere can slow us down enough. This is what it looks like looking out the window. Those uh, pieces of the heat shield melting away is per design, so that's all good news as we're traveling through that ball of flame. So, um, then when the parachute opens sometime later, for me, that was a very joyous event. I've heard other people say that it's such a jolt that uh, they feel a little nauseous, but I was so happy the parachute opened that I didn't care about the jolt. <laughs> so underneath all those clouds is a February day in Central Asia. So it's much uh, less pleasant looking on the ground where the search and rescue forces were traveling to meet us. You can see the blackened descent module from the heat of reentry. And I'm sure they were just as happy that we showed up in the right spot as we were happy that they showed up in the right spot. We get taken very careful care of once we land. Uh, there's a wide variety of how you feel when you get, when you get back. Uh, being able to call home on a satellite phone was a, a nice thing to do as soon as we finished up. But really, within 24 hours, Joe Acaba and I had gotten back, all the way back to Houston. And I was really amazed at how quickly we were able to, to function better and better. Still a lot of muscle soreness for several weeks afterwards, but I was at least able to walk down those steps. And that's six months in 17 minutes. I'm gonna continue talking for a little bit longer because there's some, uh, a little bit more about the perspective thing that I wanna share is um, the lasting change in how I perceive existence from the views I had on the space station. So the space station itself is gorgeous, as you can see from these solar panels in, in that lighting. Um, but the Earth is, it puts it to shame. The reason I'm showing you this picture is I want to try to show how otherworldly the space, uh, the Earth can seem when you're looking at it from space. It struck me like these were islands of clouds and the atmosphere is super, super thin. One of the first emotions I had when I got to the space station and looked at this type of view was when you have such a bright Earth in the foreground, those stars that we saw in the videos don't show up because your eyes can't adjust to both. So it makes the Earth look very, very isolated, which in fact it is. We're very far away from everything else. But pictures like this made that, gave that an emotional feel. Uh, recently, uh, this is a picture of northwestern Italy. The Alps are on the right side of the picture, and the uh, northwest Italy, the Po Valley, is in the left side of the picture. We recently did an event in Italy, and I was, we were traveling towards northern Italy in a train, and I looked... To, out the window and I could see the Apennine mountain range far off in the distance across this plain. And it really struck me, it was a very strange feeling for me because prior to that, the last time I had seen the Apennine mountain range, this mountain range that travels the whole length of the Italian peninsula, was from space. And I could not just see the whole mountain range, but I could see the west coast of Italy and the east coast of Italy all at the same time. But then when I was on the ground, there was that mountain range that was so far away. So this this kind of scale change is, is uh, hard for the human brain to adapt to. This is a picture of the Himalayas that I'm showing because the shadows help, uh, help you understand the, uh, the changes of, of elevation a lot better than otherwise. So you can see those jagged mountain peaks standing out in the clouds here. And also, here you can see a glacier, and it's kind of neat that you can see the debris from the mountains traveling down the ice in that glacier. Some more ice. This is west of Greenland as some uh, ice is breaking up in the ocean. And then when I took this picture, I thought I was taking a picture of some very bizarre clouds. But then when I looked closer at it later, I noticed that, hey, these are clouds. This is something else. And I think, please, if there's someone in the room that knows exactly what that is, help me out. But I think that's seawater freezing. This is also a picture close to Greenland. And then again about the sun glint, you can see in this picture some of those patterns that 
really massive patterns in the ocean that form from the wind and interaction with the water. Can't, I can't talk enough about the colors of the Caribbean, and this is a picture of the Bahamas. And then across the Atlantic, we get those amazing colors of the deserts of North Africa. Where it's less arid we, and there's more people, we can clearly see evidence of agriculture. And again, city lights show up really well. I mentioned to somebody earlier today that uh, I was going to show a picture of New York. Here it is. So this is New York City. There's Long Island. You can see the Jersey Shore. I'm probably blocking the view for some of you. At least you can't see the pointer. And then here's Philadelphia. Back here, we've got Montreal and Toronto, and then Quebec City back there. And then further in the back, we've got those northern lights again. Natural lighting was just as dramatic, if not more dramatic, than lights that humans created. This is a picture of lightning taken from space. So we're looking through the top side of the cloud, and that's just the lightning glowing through the cloud. And those uh, sunrises and sunsets never get old. This, is, uh, this picture right here is really important to me because on the left side of the picture, you can see the Indian subcontinent. On the right side of the picture, you can see the Tibetan Plateau. And between the two, we've got the Himalayas, the tallest mountain range on the planet. But if you follow that mountain range that goes all the way to the horizon, it doesn't even show up. So these huge features that are so dramatic for us when we're looking at them at the ground, they, on this smooth, relative to the size of the Earth, they don't even pop up. And that thin atmosphere right here, looking at pictures like this, it really struck me that all of us, all of human existence, except for space exploration, has taken place in what seems to be a thin veneer of air on the, on the outside of a massive rock. And now when I'm, looking, when I'm standing on the Earth and looking up through the atmosphere, it's clear to me that there's, we're on a planet in space. We're all in space, only separated from the vacuum of space by a lot of air molecules. That's it. When I was in space, I was separated from the vacuum of space by metal. We're all basically, it's very clear to me that we're on a spacecraft that's kind of unique because the crew, all of us, are standing on the outside of the spacecraft. So thanks very much for your time. Um, that concludes. I'm going to go to questions very shortly. And then uh, the closing comment I want to make is it's extremely clear to me because of the things I got to see, the things I got to do, that science is incredibly essential to not just improving our lives here and now, but to changing our perspective on how we perceive our existence and making sure that we can continue that existence here. Thanks very much. Thanks. All right, first question I think is on, please. Uh, what was the Soyuz landing like? <laughs> <laughs> it was abrupt. Um, yeah, the Soyuz landing, I heard people t say before I got to do it myself that it is a lot like a car crash. I haven't been in a car crash, but now I think I know what it'll be like. I honest, my first reaction was, so I made a mistake. I got trained before we land to make sure my mouth was closed and my head was back in the seat. So I had my mouth closed, and then we were getting a countdown to when we were going to impact. But you saw all those clouds, so it was probably hard for those helicopters to tell us when they thought we were going to hit. And I think they were a little off, because if my memory serves, I kind of remember hearing a 10, 9, and then wham, we hit really hard. And I think I might have had my head out of the seat, because I hit my head so hard that I thought, how would it feel if, how, would I know if I have a concussion right now? But it, it, was, it was dramatic, yeah, it was a hard hit. But I, was, I didn't have a concussion. We definitely survived it, so it was, it was good, successful. Great question. Uh, all those uh, photos and videos were, were really beautiful, and you talked about the fact that you couldn't see the stars because of the high contrast. But earlier with those Apple images, you could see the stars and everything. And my impression is that the dynamic range of the eye is, la or is more than what most good cameras are. So how did that happen? 
Well, I can tell you the cameras are amazing. They really are very good. But I, I think I might have misled you a little bit because when the Earth is sunlit, your eyes um, can't see the stars at the same time, much like you can't see the stars very well when, the moon, when there's a full moon. Um, at night, if you're in the space station and the lights are on, you can't see the stars very well either. But if you turn off the lights in the vicinity of the cupola, let your eyes adjust to the darkness, then you can, you can definitely see the stars. Thanks. Uh, right now, all over the city of Houston, families are fighting over the thermostat. So who controls the thermostat on the station and wh about what temperature is it usually? Randy, correct me if I'm wrong, I thought it was about 72 degrees or so. Um, and the ground control team, the space station in general is controlled by the ground control team. We are not, the astronauts do not fly the space station. We get a lot of training so that if uh, we end up in a situation where we lose communications with the space station, uh, with the ground control team, we can control things, but our major focus is to regain that communication with the ground control team so they can do it. They do a really good job of it. And one of those little things that they control is the thermostat. But we can just call down and say, hey, can you change it? And that's happened before. Crews have said it's too hot or too cold. And, but otherwise, uh, it was very comfortable, very much a shirt sleeves environment. Thanks. Hello. Um, yes, uh, I'm an educator, and my students uh, participate in zero robotics every year. And I saw the footage um, of them working with the spheres. And I just wanted, if there was anything you'd like to say that I could relay to my students about their participation in that program and what they're trying to achieve. Well, I can tell you that I'm uh, not just participating in that experiment, but also some of the talks I've seen being here this week. I am really, really impressed with students these days. They're far better than I ever was. Um, they, I'm just really, really blown away by the things that uh, the, the generation that's coming up and is gonna start being space explorers are able to do. I'm very, very impressed. So keep it up is what I would say. You're doing great. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, oh. I dream of seeing space. Uh, like you did, but what did you dream when you were up there in microgravity? And in turn, what did, did you dream of being up back in microgravity when you were back on Earth? I don't remember, I, don't, I slept so well that I didn't remember a lot of my dreams, because for me at least, I only remember the dreams when I wake up in the middle of them. Um, I don't remember a, a, a change in my dreams. What I can tell you that changed for me though, was we'd watch a movie, and I remember feeling like, wait a minute, how, I was so used to seeing people move, in space, that when we'd have a movie night and I'd see people walking around, or maybe they, I was, I was like, well, that doesn't work that way. What the? So that was, a, and I knew that, you know, I was just, my perceptions were a little off, but uh, that was interesting. Another thing along the same lines is when the space newbies, when you want to throw something to somebody else, we always hit the ceiling because we're so used to compensating for the lack of enough velocity to avoid hitting the earth that we throw it up a little bit. And so when you're on the space station, you throw it the same way, you throw it up but it goes up. Um, so eventually you throw it, just kind of line it right up and it works great. Thanks. Over here. I was wondering what the uh, current state, of, I guess, of the microbial situation is up on the ISS. Um, and if uh, part of your Saturday morning activities, I'm actually working on analyzing a few different ISS microbial studies right now. Um, if part of the Saturday morning activities could even potentially help favor it one genera over another, or um, if there's any sort of ongoing struggle with a particular species, or so I'm not, I think I understood that you're asking about the microbial growth on the space station. Yes. And if there's some places that we have to pay more attention to than others, is that? Yeah, and uh, I guess or particular strategies, um, you know, I guess dual, uh, you know, for to help uh, combat. Uh, certain species that might have an acquired resistance to one cleaner and, or another cleaner. Um, just trying to get a feel for what the, if, if that's part of the Saturday routine, I guess. So I would say the Saturday routine is much like a Saturday routine at, at home. It makes things cleaner. Um, that's a simple answer. Uh, it's, it is really important. It's, it's a place we've been having people live that's very constrained um, for a very long period of time. And it's a very clean environment. So it's very essential to, to clean up um, and honestly, I can tell you uh, 
So when I first got to the space station, I was the only guy that hadn't been in space for at least two months. So I was the only guy that everybody else had to look out for. Um, and I remember, I'll never forget opening up my first bag of rice. And Randy's laughing over there because he remembers it too, I'm sure. But the rice went everywhere. Uh, it took me a while to realize that I had to use the garlic paste as food glue. And uh, that made things stick together a little better. Sunflower seeds, if I wanted to eat sunflower seeds, um, most other crew members just avoided it. I would just make sure I was next to a vent so that the airflow would make all the, the sunflower seeds that didn't end up in my mouth or the debris associated with sunflower seeds end up on the grating and we could vacuum it up later. Um, so yeah, there's places on the space station that are messier than others. And all I can really say is it is really important to spend the time to clean it up. Please. A question about your EVA. The first time you went out, how close did the uh, pool training approximate what it was really like out there in space? Um, very, very good question, an important one. The, uh, the pool we used to train uh, did an incredibly good job of having me be very comfortable with what I would see when I was operating um, outside the space station. That environment was familiar to me. I knew where things were. It was also very good at having me be familiar with my spacesuit and how to use the tools that were on my body. The one thing I noticed that uh, was very different is that because of water drag, I was in the habit of starting my motion and then having to start it again and having to keep adding more force to keep myself moving. And as you can imagine, that's more fatiguing as you need in a space where you're basically floating. Um, fortunately for me, between my first and second space walk, I only had five days. And that was a good time to think about what I struggled with the first time and try to improve it on the next time. And I thought I actually consciously made an effort to stop myself, let go, make sure I was going to stay exactly where I was supposed to. Because as long as I didn't, if, if I let go of the space station as I was kind of panicked and moving really fast like this, guess what? I was going to keep moving like that. That's bad. So if I, want, if I just very gracefully let go of something, then I would stay there. If once I started a, a nice steady motion in one direction, I could just kind of tend to myself and make sure that I was keeping the same direction, make sure I was keeping in contact, but I didn't have to apply more force. So that was kind of a little bit of counter training with the water drag. But otherwise, it's, a, it's an amazing facility, and uh, I don't know how we could do any better. Thanks, Thanks for the time uh, for one more. Or is it, we, we have two, but yeah. do you want to come over here? Go ahead. So, yeah, thanks for the fascinating talk. Um, I'm a, a scientist and interested in doing material science related research on ISS. And just when you were mentioning the challenges and following those protocols doing experiments, could you elaborate on how could we either design better experiments and, and from the practical perspective, how to make it easier and more practical on ISS when you conduct them? Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a, a big challenge. I think it's, uh, it's going to continue to be a challenge. The thing about science is we're always doing something new and we're discovering. And because of that, the procedures probably haven't been done that many times. Whereas the maintenance procedures on the space station have been done so many times, they've had the benefit of getting feedback on those procedures. Um, so they tend to be something that's very readily understood the first time. I think the challenge is just like if you're, if you're writing something or you're very familiar with a topic and you need to teach it, it's being able to relate to the lack of understanding that somebody else who's going to have to follow your instructions has. So I would just say try to get somebody who has no idea of the background on your procedure. And I know we have people at NASA that help out with that. So uh, getting someone to try it who has no experience is really uh, a good way to highlight things that you didn't realize an inexperienced person with that experiment. Um, with a pitfall that they might run into. But honestly, having the ability to talk to the primary investigators while we're doing those things is also very helpful. And the videos, the videos that we are including in procedures these days are incredibly helpful. There's so many things that get conveyed in, uh, in a video that are hard to convey with uh, written words. Thank you. Great. I think, is that, are we good? Great. Yeah. Please, everybody. Uh, Give another round of applause for NASA astronaut Mark Van Hyde. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks.